On November 23, 2023, Dr. Sharif Emil delivered a lecture by the title of Life Leadership Lessons at the McGill University Department of Pediatric Surgery Grand Rounds. In this unique lecture, attended by a large number of Dr. Emil's colleagues, friends, patients, and family members in person and online, Dr. Emil shared the values and events that have shaped his life, the lessons learned during his personal and professional journeys spanning many decades, and his perspective on many current issues in medicine and beyond. The following is a hybrid recording of this lecture. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, it, it's really uh, a very emotional day for me. Um, I have given a lot of talks this last year. Um, and usually I pretty much know what I want to say. I just have to put it into slides and pictures and quote literature and publications and things like that. But um, this was this was different because I actually had to for weeks think about what I really wanted to say. Uh, happy Thanksgiving um, for the audience who may be celebrating that today, Carolina and other people who have a, an American connection. It's my favorite day of the year because it really is a day about inclusion. You know, some people celebrate Christmas, some people celebrate Ramadan, some people celebrate Yom Kippur, but everybody celebrates Thanksgiving in the US. There are 30 million people who've traveled in this last few days to be with their family. So uh, it's really a special day to be able to give this talk on Thanksgiving day. Um, it's been a busy week, but I think my wife is gonna surprise me with some turkey tonight. And um, it also is a lot of poetic justice in giving this talk today because the overwhelming uh, feeling I have as I look at some of my patients and their parents and friends and family and people I've known for decades and all the people who are online today. I don't know how many people are online, Lily, so far. So a lot of people are joining us today. And um, my overwhelming feeling is really that of gratitude. Um, I'll be sharing a lot of feelings with you, but my overwhelming feeling today is that of gratitude. And therefore, um, it's really wonderful that I get to give this on Thanksgiving Day. I have to start with this disclosure. Uh, the reflections, thoughts, and opinions um, expressed in this lecture are strictly those uh, of the presenter, myself, and do not necessarily represent those of the Department of Pediatric Surgery, the McGill University Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, the Montreal Children's Hospital, the McGill University Health Center, the McGill University Health Center Research Institute, or the McGill Institute for Health Sciences Education. And with that, hopefully there'll be a little bit less chance that this actually will be my very last lecture. Um, when the title came out, I received a lot of panicky emails. Oh, when are you leaving? When are you retiring? And um, well, I don't know, <laughs> but that wasn't the intent of calling this the last lecture. This is actually uh, a strong academic tradition, even though it tends to be a very personal lecture that's not scientific. This is a strong academic tradition. And I learned about it for the first time um, when I heard about Randy Poach. Maybe some of you have known his story, but he was a young, uh, energetic, talented professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer very early in his early 40s and he had three kids and he um, had a chance to survive for a few months. But during that time, he really spent a lot of time thinking, what does he want to say? And he got to give this last lecture uh, to a big audience um, that then was published later uh, with, his, uh, with his wife's help uh, and really became um, kind of a constitution for how people think about their lives and academics and what is the legacy they'd like to leave behind? What do they think their kids need to hear about what they did? And, and, the, and the book is just full of wise comments. Um, one of the things that always struck me in the book is, you know, he says people always ask him, like, what is the secret of your success? And he would tell them, come to my office any Friday at 9 p.m. and I'll be more than happy to tell you. Um, and it was really all about hard work and, and persistence and perseverance. And um, he died in July of 2008, um, just a couple of months before I came to start here. And it was actually the very first book I read when I arrived. Um, so that was 15 years ago. And I, over the 15 years, often thought, what would I say when I'm giving my last lecture? Um, and so the thoughts I'm going to share with you today have been a long time coming. Um, the past informs a future. 
If you want to know where you're going, you have to know where you came from. I know many of you have heard me say this many times. Well, my path starts with my parents. Uh, my parents were physicians who met in medical school in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, and actually, they were in two different medical schools, but they had some common rotations and then spent quite a bit of time in the first year out of medical school together. And um, it was really a, a pretty unusual love story because uh, this is in the early 1960s. And my mother happened to be eight years older than my dad. Now, those of you who are familiar with uh, our culture will know right away that this was something very, very, very unusual. And probably even in our society here back then, it would have been something very, very, very unusual. Uh, but my parents married. And um, at that time, after medical school, you had to go to a rural area for a few years to serve. Uh, every medical graduate had to do that. So they went to uh, tiny towns where often my mother was the only female physician that had ever been seen. In fact, in the province where they settled, she was only the second female physician to have ever practiced there. Uh, but my mom was my first role model. Um, if you look at this picture, not only did I adore her and she adored me, but you might notice that she's sitting in a bit of an unusual position. Her right um, leg is extended. There's a scar in it, and it's in a bit of an unusual position. My mother was struck with osteomyelitis um, in the uh, 40s and 50s when she was a young girl. Uh, there was no antibiotics. She had seven operations to remove what was called sequester at the time. Finally, they fused her knee and she was left for um, a permanently disabled individual. In fact, her father at this time was a, was a businessman who traded in cotton. He was very wealthy and he essentially appointed her somebody to just look after her. And the idea was that she would never leave a wheelchair. Uh, you have to remember, there was no real physiotherapy. There was no real rehab. Um, and she um, rehabbed herself. She insisted that she was going to walk. And uh, it took her seven years, but she walked. And she walked right into medical school. And that's why she was seven years older than my father and everybody else in her class. Um, but what I love most about my mother is that she insisted always that she will be, she will act and she will demand to be treated as a first class citizen. And she thought a first class citizen is a citizen who enjoys the full rights and exercises the full responsibilities of citizenship. My mother exercised EDI before EDI was cool. Um, and this is really one of my favorite pictures of her. Not this is, was the reception for the Minister of Health and all the bigwigs from the Provincial Health Authority, the CEOs of the local hospitals. You know, this was a big, a big, huge reception. And as you see, she's the only woman. But I don't like this picture because she's the only woman. I like it because she was not the only woman sort of cowering in the background or trying to keep a low profile. She was front and center. And um, that posture she took uh, ended up being a inspiration for many women who followed her. And she really became a spokesperson for women's rights in medicine, uh, for people to be treated fairly. And you have to remember who my mother was. She was a disabled female Christian woman in a society that really did not look so well upon people of that type. Uh, but my mother insisted that she was, and that instilled in me very early on a desire to promote women, to stand up for the rights of girls and women wherever they might come from, but especially in disadvantaged societies. And I have never apologized for that, and I never will apologize for that. This is something that I will continue to advocate for uh, for the rest of my life. Um, but my mother also um, was a very humble woman. And she was really led, uh, the, the theme of her life was the gospel um, verse from them to whom much has been given, much will be required. And she often reminded me that, you know, a lot of people worked as hard as you did and did not get the opportunities that you did. So do not feel entitled. Do not feel that uh, just because you paid your dues, now you should get this and that and the other. Um, she also really exemplified this uh, favorite Winston Churchill quote, you make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. She passed away in my hospital in California where I worked, and um, she, uh, we memorialized her through this, um, through this uh, award that's awarded to a UCI resident every year for 
exceptional humanism in surgery. Uh, but another lesson from my parents was that um, if you want to be resilient, you really have to be humble. Um, that satisfaction does not emanate from what you do, but from how you do it. My parents immigrated to the States quite late in their lives. My father was 50. My mother was almost 58 when they immigrated. So they didn't come as young immigrants, um, you know, seeking opportunity. It was a massive sacrifice for them to immigrate, a massive sacrifice. They actually had a very good standard of living. They were both physicians. My father was an orthopedic surgeon. He faced tremendous discrimination, but he still established a strong practice. Um, and, you know, we had two homes, we had two cars. By the standards of the community where we lived, we were very comfortable. I was going to the best school in the country. Um, so my parents didn't move for financial motivations. Um, I'll, I'll, later, I'll explain to you a bit um, the ethos of why, why they moved. Um, but when they moved, um, my father still wanted to practice medicine. He still, he was an orthopedic surgeon and he wanted to continue to be. He was 50, he had to take all his exams over, biochemistry, physiology, you bet. And he had to go through all that again. And then he started residency at age 55. And you know, when I was thinking about that the other day, I said, you know, uh, there's a lot of problems I had with my father. There's a lot of, um, we were very different in character and yet also very similar and that kind of can create a tough relationship. Um, but I was just thinking that's about my, you know, not too far from my age right now. How would I have been able to go through a residency at this age? And it just was just absolutely stunning to me that he had that type of resilience with which he could work with people who were 30 years younger than him and still be his boss. And my mother, who was getting close to 60, was not going to go back and do that. And she uh, went from being head of her health authority, working with the US uh, Agency for International Development, traveling all over the place, to teaching in a school for medical assistance, mostly with single mothers on welfare who had been given a, a uh, condition to go to school if they wanted to keep their welfare. And it is amazing how she changed her character immediately to focus on that um, as her mission. Um, the students my wife knows very well used to call her mom. That was actually their expression. They didn't call her Dr. Gadala. They didn't call her professor. They called her mom. And um, she just took such an intense interest in every one of them to try to help them through life, to try to give them the, the, the instruments by which they can succeed. And it's almost like she had forgotten her career. Her previous career became irrelevant to her. Now she had a very different mission, and she lived that mission until literally the day she went into the hospital for the very last time. I was thinking this morning, I just added the slide this morning, because I was thinking, how do I uh, describe to you my parents' relationship? And I thought this one really describes it best. Um, this is Loma Linda, California where my parents lived for a long time. And this is where my mom and dad are buried. And my mom had a very <laughs> unusual sense of humor. Um, when she was choosing their burial site, she said, I don't want to be cramped up. I want a place where I can see people coming and going. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, she has such a view. She has such a view. But the reason I'm showing you this is after my mom passed away, my dad's routine every Saturday was to travel the 45 minutes and spend his afternoon in this park um, um, memorializing her. And, um, you know, we say until death do us part, but for my parents, death did actually did not do, do them part. And he did that for well over eight years, Saturday, without exception. That was his routine. I lost a brother um, when I was young. Um, my brother um, was born with a much nicer head of hair than I ever had, uh, but he had a problem with his heart. Um, he had a tetralogy, a fellow diagnosed clinically. There was no echo back then and all that. And this was in the mid 60s. There was really was no hope and he died at three months of age. And I lived with that experience for a good part of my life. I really got to understand what it is like to lose a child. And um, it came back to me when I was applying for pediatric surgery that probably one of the things that truly motivated me to go into pediatric surgery was the fact that my brother died of a correctable surgical anomaly. And this was the very first paragraph in my essay applying to pediatric surgery. The baby was born to two young physicians 
beginning their practice in rural Egypt. Shortly after birth, he was noticed to be cyanotic and was presumptively diagnosed with tetralogy of Fallot. No help was available, and the baby died after several months. That baby was my little brother. As you know, I spend a lot of time in Africa, and I often tell people that the only thing more difficult than seeing your child sick is seeing your child sick and not be able to do anything about it. Just seeing them deteriorate slowly in front of your eyes. That is a pain. No matter how long I spend in this field, I cannot imagine that I really truly comprehend. And amazingly, it would happen to me again with my last fellowship patient. This little girl who was actually just past 18 at the time, Julie Perrault, uh, who I had become so close to. She had spina bifida. She had come in with a gastric volvulus. My senior fellow had operated on her. She had all types of complications. And the last time she came into the hospital, she told me, I'm not going to be leaving the hospital. And I said, why would you say that? You know, you've been through this so many times, Julie. She said, my grandfather came to me in the dream yesterday and told me that I'll be joining him. She was right. She never left the hospital. She was my second to last patient to operate on. She died that night in the operating room uh, as we were trying to save her life. And it's the only time I remember that Jean Martin and I cried our eyes out for hours together at the same time. And many years later, I would tell medical students this, the families I have bonded with the most have not been the ones who experienced fast cures, not the ones who underwent pioneering procedures, not the ones who benefited from the latest research findings, not even the ones whose children I saved from certain death. The families I have bonded with the most have been the ones whose children's funerals I have attended. And like many of you in the room and many of you online, I am sure you remember each single one of those patients, because I remember those patients all the way back to my fellowship years. My parents then left for Nigeria. We lived in very tiny towns. Often uh, we were, they were the only physicians and often we were the only expatriate family in town. Um, one of the towns we lived in, Lauren, was the only town that was really large enough to, to have a, a, a larger community. And I learned two really important lessons there growing up. One is really what diversity means. Diversity doesn't mean you give up your beliefs or you have to be like somebody else. Or, But my friends were white and Indian or, and black, and it was amazing harmony um, between us um, because we were in a small community, um, and um, it really, um, we were each other's support. Um, the other thing I learned in Nigeria, I know you saw this picture before, is, you know, you can't always get what you want, but you always can get what you need. Uh, there, Mick Jagger, that's the only time I'm going to quote you. Um, and, and, and I remember in Lokoja, again, very small town, I really wanted to ride a bike. But there was no bike. There were no bikes for kids. There's nothing my, my size. So my parents said, the only thing we can get you is this. I said, fine, I'll take it. And my, my feet could not reach the pedals. So I had to kick one pedal to be able to get the next pedal up. And I couldn't stop. Because if I stopped, you know what would happen. So I would had to find a tree to slow down and lean over to be able to stop. And that was such a useful experience because it really taught me from that point going on that you can always find a solution. And it was amazing to me when I went back to Africa 25 years later and I went to a tiny village called Ilyondo, a small Catholic regional hospital. And we went with the uh, flying doctor program where you know they fly in um, and assist a, a, a local medical team with a number of surgeries over a week, literally in the bush. And I was just shocked. I was shocked because a quarter century had passed and nothing had changed. These were the type of hospitals where my parents worked and there was nothing. You could get a CBC and a malaria smear and that's it. Um, the uh, OR looked like this, uh, an autoclave to clean the, uh, to, to steam the, uh, the drapes and the uh, cloth material and boiling of the instruments. That's how we worked for a week. The anesthesiologist, anesthetist, six months of training, there was no monitor, there was no pulse socks, there was no ventilator. So her assistant would ventilate the patient. Her left hand was the patient's um, cardiac monitor to check the pulse, and her eyes were the patient's pulse socks to look, at, um, to look at the lips. And it was truly amazing because we operated on close to 30 cases in a week without a single complication. And it just went to show um, the burden 
This is a, a man who had come in with a squamous cell carcinoma that he eroded through his wrist, the only forearm amputation I've ever done in my life. Um, but the beautiful thing about it is that uh, you could meet a group of people that you had not met ever before, and you can find common purpose and common vision. And it was wonderful to work with Tanzanians. This is Tom Rawson here, a Dutch surgeon who never saw himself as Dutch. He always described himself as Kenyan. I just met with Tom last March after 20 some years had passed and it was amazing to me when he was talking to me and he, would, he kept saying, us Kenyans and us, and you know, it taught me that it's not about your color. You know, people are always trying to divide us. You are this race and you are that race and you, it's not about that. It's about how you identify and who you identify with. You can be white or black or Asian or whatever it might be. But it was beautiful to work with this team. We would have breakfast together. We would operate. We would have lunch together. We would operate. We would have dinner together. And then by the light of a tiny little bulb, could hardly see each other, we would be telling stories and laughing all night. And then I would go to bed and cover myself because there were all things, kinds of things crawling on the ceiling. Um, so um, that was one amazing lesson I had from my first mission. The second amazing lesson I had from my first mission back to Africa was the true belief that everybody deserves the best, that we should not be saying, uh, well, we're not going to do this procedure because, you know, it's not needed in Africa. So I had just finished general surgery training. I hadn't started pediatric surgery yet. Of course, I was very uh, comfortable with laparoscopic techniques at this point. I trained during the age of, you know, the laparoscopic revolution, and I, I got Olympus and stores and many other companies literally to donate hundreds, tens of thousands of dollars, and I took all this equipment with me. And at that time in Nairobi, there were two surgeons doing laparoscopic surgery at the Aga Khan Hospital, which is sort of the hospital of the rich in Nairobi. And it was outside the reach of 95% of the population. And our bishop, who, who ran our mission hospital there, said, no, that's not right. We need to offer that to ordinary people. And he put this ad in the, in the local paper, and we had lineups of people waiting for laparoscopic surgery. Um, and we again showed that working as teams, we can really do amazing things together. Um, this, this is our medical team again, um, Indian anesthesiologists, Kenyan nurses, one of my dearest friends, Safwat Andrawas, who might be on the uh, call today, who committed his entire life to helping uh, the most vulnerable people. And this was what I call, uh, these are some of the first lab coli graduates, uh, some of the first patients in Kenya who had this procedure. Um, and I brought this experience with me, and I really, when, when I came here, I really strongly wanted to make sure that our fellows have this, um, this experience. Lisa's been writing great articles for a long time. Lisa, I just noticed that your name was on that article. Uh, thank you, Lisa, by the way, for organizing the photography for today, despite very difficult circumstances. I had given up on it, and you still came through. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate everything, by the way, that the foundation has done and all their partnership here over the last many years. So um, within a short time, uh, we sent our first fellow, uh, Dr. Robert Baird, to Kijabi because I really wanted our fellows to experience that environment that I'm talking about. And when Rob came back, he said, we need to make this an exchange. And within a few months, we made this an exchange, working with Dan Panaro, who was still um, in Africa at the time. I so believed in this um, that I really, it was the first thing I pushed for very hard, and we didn't have funding. And I so believed in it that I actually decided to fund the first fellow myself. Frihun Ayali came back. He was an Ethiopian training in Kenya and became our fellow. And I remember very well that Frihun was not able to get a visa. This is a Canadian embarrassment, a Canadian embarrassment that has continued where surgeons from Africa who are not coming here to be refugees, they're not coming here to use our resources, are denied visas to come to Canada. And we had this 15 years later, I had to again visit this. And you need to let people know that that is not appropriate. You know, we love to talk about racism and anti-racism and equity. We don't practice it. And for whom, I had to go all the way to the Minister of Immigration, specifically, to get him a visa. And thankfully, he got his visa just enough to come back to Montreal and continue on to Saskatoon for the CAPS meeting the same day because his visa was so late. Um, but we published our experience, and it still stands as a model. I think we were the first to create such a program, and it still stands as a model. But interestingly, the hierarchy of pediatric surgery did not believe in this. I went, Pramod, um, I went to represent Pramod, who was our program director, 
at the time in a meeting in San Francisco, and this came up, and I stood up to explain why this is important, and I was mobbed. I was mobbed, and Pramod was listening on the phone um, to, you know, with program directors, oh, you want to send people for adventures, and you, <laughs> and I just was taken aback by, by the, the posture that we sometimes take that some things are just not right without people, most of those people had never stepped in Africa. They didn't know what I was talking about. And so after that, the American Board of Surgery and the uh, Graduate Medical Education Council committee basically said that pediatric surgeon fellows cannot go. They're not allowed to go, period. And, you know, a lot of people at the time said, you better lay low because this could put your program in jeopardy. You know, you don't want to come. And we were, we were accredited by the Royal College, so we were able to get away with it. Uh, but I didn't. I, I, I just I stayed in everybody's face. Anytime there was a panel talking about this, I was up there saying, this is not right. You, you need to you need to change this. Um, and, you know, to the young people here, sometimes the hierarchy looks like makes you seem little like, what are you talking about? Who are you? It's OK. Just stay in their face. You know, at some point they will listen to you. It took five years. But the American Board of Surgery just about a year ago reversed their decision. And now pediatric surgery fellows are able to go for rotations in Africa. Continuing on with my life. Um, my wife and kids are driven crazy because I am such a news junkie. I, I really am. I, I'm all, I always want to watch, and I can't just watch one news because, you know, um, I, I'm starting to think that there really is something called fake news. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I watch multiple different sources to get a better balanced picture. Uh, but why do I do that? Because growing up, what you saw in the news translated to what happens in your home, sometimes within hours. And that happened on October 6, 1973. Um, none of us knew that a war was going to happen. It was kept very, very secret. Uh, Egypt was in a horrible morale state after the 1967 war, losing all of the Sinai. Uh, a president had just died. Another president had taken over, was trying to get a foothold on the country. And um, we suddenly heard on October 6 that a war has broken out. Um, the next day, my father was gone. There were not enough military orthopedic surgeons, and many civilian orthopedic surgeons were drafted. And he went from wearing a suit uh, to wearing military fatigue. And um, it was one of the scariest times in my life. And I remember two things very vividly that month. My birthday was about two weeks later. There was a military airport close to our home. And everybody expected that our town is going to be bombed. Our town was never bombed. In fact, um, neither the Egyptian side nor the Israeli side in the, 1970, in the 1973 war bombed any civilian populations. Um, there really was something called the rules of war, which sadly, sadly, we have lost. Uh, but um, my birthday was coming, and every night, um, the civil defense forces would, were out in full gear asking people to keep their lights off. They did not want any lights to show up in case there is going to be a raid. So my mother wanted to celebrate my birthday. And she decided to get this thick black cardboard, cover all of the windows so that our lights don't show. And we had a small birthday party with me, her, and our nanny. The other thing I remember is every day I didn't know if my father would come back. He would sometimes be gone to, he, he never was assigned to a field hospital, but he would go to field hospitals. And many of his colleagues never came back from those field hospitals. And sometimes for three, four days at a time, there was no internet, there was no cell phone, you know, and we would not know. We simply would not know, is he coming back or not? My father did come back, and when he came back, he did not come back bitter. He came back just really hating war. A lot of kids used to play with guns back then, toy guns probably still do. And the first thing he did when he came back, he took all of the guns and threw them in the garbage. I even had a toy helicopter I remember I used to love playing with. He did not want to see it. But the stories he would share with me were not stories of bitterness, were stories of at least what could be learned from the war. He would tell me stories about Egyptian soldiers coming back from Israeli hospitals in top shape, taken care of uh, in an impressive way. He would tell me stories of Israeli prisoners of war who would come in to Egyptian field hospitals and, and, and the instructions from above were to treat them first, to make sure they get 
as good care as the Egyptian soldiers. So there is no hint that there's been any kind. This, this is how it was. Um, but he also really instilled in me um, a, a, a true hate for war. So um, we lived in Saudi Arabia for a short period of time and then came back to Egypt at an amazing time in 77 where peace was breaking out. President Sadat had said that he's ready to visit Israel um, unconditionally. A few weeks, an invitation was extended, and he was in Israel, and then the Camp David Accords happened, and everybody was like, we are now in peace. And my dad was just elated because he had seen so many young people dead. He had seen so many mothers wailing over their kids. Um, and um, it was really an unusual time. Um, a time of great optimism, a time of, 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 of great possibilities. And, um, but Sadat was still a military dictator. Uh, the fact that he was peace-loving did not make him a benevolent leader. And he cracked down. He put our uh, pope uh, under house arrest and removed him. He cracked down on all kinds of people who opposed him. And on the same day that he waged the war, he was assassinated. And I remember so well, it was always a day off, October 6th, a holiday, we were watching TV. There was always this huge military parade that would last for hours, and you know, it was a big affair, and, and the transmission just stopped, the TV stopped. And I remember both my parents were there, and my dad said, Sadat has just been assassinated. And my mom said, what are you talking about? Of course not. It's just a technical problem. Glitches like that happen all the time. They always interrupt. He said, no. If somebody interrupted the broadcast while he's there, that person wouldn't be here tomorrow. Sadat's just been assassinated. And um, we had no news until that night on the BBC radio when we heard that Sadat was assassinated and we heard who assassinated him. The fundamentalist Islamist cell within the army. And those were days of terror. Days of terror. Because we didn't know who was going to take over the country. And we knew that if those people with that mentality took over the country, we would likely have to go into hiding. And it wasn't just us. It was our Muslim neighbors who had seen what has happened in Iran and what transpired to so many people who did not agree with that style of government. And they were as scared as we were. But um, life continued, and I was, I was able to graduate from high school in uh, 1982. Um, really amazing high school. I had 75 uh, students in my class. This is a picture of our class on the steps of the pyramids. Um, with 25 different nationalities. Uh, we graduated right at the foot of the Sphinx. Um, it was really, again, another tremendous exercise uh, in diversity. And I left my parents to go to the University of Michigan. And that was another amazing sacrifice on the part of my parents, both because it was extremely expensive. They were going to spend their life savings on, on me to put me through school in the States. But at that time, people just in Egypt did not go. You know, they would go for master's degrees, they would go for graduate degrees, but 17-year-old kids did not leave their parents, and especially if they were an only child, which I was. And in Michigan is where I became an adult. It really was. It was just, I cannot describe the environment that I found myself in. I went from having the same number of students on my, um, on my corridor in the dorm as my entire high school class from a school that had less than 1,000 to a university that had close to 40,000 students. But I was just in heaven because it was always like ideas and more ideas and controversies and you could say this and you could say that and, and it, I had not been used to that. You had to watch everything you were saying where I had grown up. And all of a sudden people could speak and debate and, and I really decided that I don't think I can go back to an environment where I cannot speak. And my parents used to joke with me all the time, we know you want to go into politics, you're not going to survive long if you come back here and go into politics. Um, so I went into engineering. Oh, that's pretty, pretty safe. Um, so uh, from Michigan, I spent a year in grad school. And um, I actually decided about halfway through that I, I wanted to be a doctor. You know, growing up, to son of two physicians, people drive you crazy. You're going to be a doctor when you grow up, right? No, I'm going to do something different. Oh, you're going to be a doctor. No. <laughs> well, I decided that I was moving away from it because I really didn't like this predestined idea. So, um, but, but then in, in Michigan, when I was a resident advisor helping kids with problems and always kind of gravitating towards you know, people-oriented things, I decided I really do want to be a doctor. But I was a foreign student. I was not American. I was not Canadian. I had no green card. I had no permanent. It was 
nearly impossible. I met with my counselor in high school and in, in, in undergrad, and he said, well, forget about that. And he showed me the statistics for the previous year. There were 26 some thousand US medical students, 16 of those were international students who were not green card holders. And he said, you see, forget it. And I said, well, 16 is not zero. And the lesson was a very, very, very low probability is not a zero probability. Um, and I, as I continue to say to my patients often, hope is not statistical. Uh, miraculously, I was admitted to McGill, still really cannot comprehend how that was possible. Um, and I spent a great four years here. And then I went back. My parents now had settled in California. I went back. I did my residency at Loma Linda. I did two years of research at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. My residency was really tough, as you can see from this picture. Uh, but we still were able to have fun. But you know, that was not the time of work limits and hour limits, 120 hour work weeks. They were not the exception. They were the rule for three months at a time would be on every other night call and then have to work the entire full day the next day. This was how life was for five years. Um, but I loved it. I really loved it. I got immersed in surgery. I felt that I was getting great training. I felt that I could go anywhere and practice. Um, and then I went to research and I really went to research because that was the thing to do. If you wanted to do pediatric surgery, you had to do research, you had to publish. And I went back to Children's Hospital Los Angeles where I had done my first rotation as a medical student and where I fell in love with pediatric surgery. And I created this, this uh, ICU for pigs. And it was very convenient because if I was talking to a surgical audience, I would call it the swine intensive care unit or SICU. And if I was talking to a pediatric audience, I would call it the porcine intensive care unit or PICU. So it fit everybody's interest. And we did some really great work. Um, we, we, we published the first papers on inhaled nitric oxide, the first surgical papers and its role. We were the first people to define what's called nitric oxide dependence. And that is when you take nitric oxide off a patient, they can crash, so you have to wean it. We were the first people to describe that. And that now is a known clinical phenomenon. And I went to the lab because I felt I had to, but I fell in love with research in the lab. And the lesson is that you really never know what you'll capture, what, what, what you'll, what will capture your imagination until you open your eyes. So be open, be open to experiences that you think you might not enjoy. But something very, very important happened during my research years. And I'm gonna slow down here a little bit, even if I can't get to the end of my talk, um, because I was having more time during research. You know, I was working, I was moonlighting at night a bit and I was working days and all of a sudden I didn't have to work 120 hour work weeks and I had a bit of time. And during those two years, right in the middle of my research, California embarked on a possibility of having a Canadian style universal healthcare system, a single payer system. And I had come in back from McGill very convinced that that is what we need, thoroughly convinced. But I had never engaged in the public sphere before. And so I was attending you know, the way that the campaign was going. So in California, you don't have to put everything through the legislature. If people want something, they can put it into a referendum that is voted on it directly and it can become law. So you can bypass your representatives because of all the special interests that are involved. Um, so I was attending one of these talks and I was just, you know, at, engaging and somebody said, you need to come and be our spokesperson. And I said, well, I'm busy, I'm a resident. No, no, you come. And before I knew it, I was on every TV station talking about Proposition 186 saying, hey, I, I knew what this is like. I, were, I was educated in Canada. And, and then um, I sent this uh, editorial to the Los Angeles Times. The vote was on November 4th, and that was, this was Halloween day, just four days before the vote. And I sent it to them way before. I didn't hear anything. Then they called me and they said, we want to put this in just before the vote. Uh, but we, we cannot have a one-sided view, so somebody else will write something opposing it. I said, that's fine. And so on October 31st, my first newspaper um, editorial on a political issue. I had written some stuff before, but my first newspaper editorial on a political issue was published. Um, and <laughs> the person who wrote the opposing editorial is this gentleman who was the CEO of Bank of America. And you know, that really just reminded me, never say I am just a resident, I am just a medical student, you have tremendous power. People want to know what you are talking about from the trenches. And the responses of the readers that came afterwards was overwhelming. For every 10 people who supported me, there might have been one person who supported him. Because people were saying, hey, this guy's a doctor. He knows what he's in. He's in the trenches. Why would you listen to a CEO of Bank of America? 
So, um, so that was an early on, and this was really, really important because I'm coming back now to why my parents came. For me, this was the first time I really, truly exercised the reason that my parents made this massive sacrifice, is that so I do not stay silent when I see something that is not right, that I have the right to talk, a right that I never would have enjoyed where I had grown up. We do not underestimate the power of your word. We hear a lot that words matter. Words do, in fact, matter. But so does silence. And sometimes, as Martin Luther King said, silence matters way, way, way more than words do. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And my friends, I can tell you that too many of us stay silent. Too many of us stay silent because we think we're physicians, we don't need to be involved in this, we're nurses, we're here to take care of people. They're not mutually exclusive. And one of my proudest days was when I testified in the Canadian Parliament. Um, I had just become a Canadian three months before, and this was my first time actually not just writing and campaigning, but actually going in and letting the voice known, but also it pointed out to me that we need to be even more involved because frankly, those who were in the committee asking me questions, I realized, sorry to use this word, there is an idiocy problem in our politics. People just don't know. They regurgitate what their leader tells them. They have no clue. They haven't been there. They don't know your life experience. And we have had this parasitic mind phenomenon where we just regurgitate what people tell us. And I was thinking, these are the people who lead us. We're in trouble. So I've been sticking my neck out for a long time. Most of you know that. And um, it's, it's difficult. I've been scrutinized many, many times. I've been threatened. My kids' lives have been threatened. Um, my career has been threatened. Um, but I wouldn't have done it any other way. Because you see, um, <laughs> I got this from a CBC News anchor, after one of the episodes where I was really being attacked harsh. Dr. Emila, I remember your story vividly and felt you had been very badly and unfairly treated. I had wanted to bring you in as a guest, but the powers would be would not permit it. My friends, this is CBC. This is our tax money that are funding an organization that's supposed to represent all of us, not just a certain agenda. And it woke me up that the society I'm so proud to be part of is gravitating towards the society I left, not the other way around as we hoped. We're gravitating towards censorship and suppression and oppression. And if you don't believe me, just believe Mr. Bean. Because Mr. Bean said the following, criticism can easily be construed as insult by certain parties, ridicule, easily construed as insult, sarcasm, unfavorable comparison, merely stating an alternative point of view to the orthodoxy can be interpreted as insult. And because so many things can be interpreted as insult, it is hardly surprising that so many things have been. A culture has taken hold of the programs of successive governments that has created a society of an extraordinarily authoritarian and controlling nature. It is what you might call the new intolerance a new but intense desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent. Because the freedom to be inoffensive is no freedom at all. And maybe none of you have lived in communities like this. I don't blame you. There are so many things I'm ignorant about that I cannot identify with. But there are those among us who have lived in communities like this, who know exactly what oppression and suppression looks like and yet misrepresented because of the gullibility of the others. And that does not become an issue of judgment. That becomes an issue of morality. I want to share with you a story. Maybe Dr. Collier is with us on the call. Kristen, if you're on the call, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, really a tremendous story that happened in July 2022. Dr. Collier is a decorated physician, family doctor multiple awards. Um, she is the director of the University of Michigan Medical School Program on Health, Spirituality, and Religion. 
she also happens to be a, a practicing, devout Catholic Christian who is pro-life. Pro um, she has never made that a secret. Uh, she has spoken in many forums on pro-life issues, but she has never, ever brought that to her education or to the class or anywhere near her academic career. The Gold Humanism Honor Society invited her to be the speaker at the University of Michigan 2022 White Coat Ceremony, where students make their first appearance in medical school. It was a couple of months after the Roe versus Wade decision that reversed um, the right to abortion in the US. Well, a number of students said, we cannot have a pro-life speaker. She cannot speak. She cannot come. We are going to walk out if she does. What did the dean do? I am so proud of my alma mater since this incident happened. He said, no. We believe in the critical importance of diversity of personal thought and ideas, which is foundational to academic freedom and excellence. We would not revoke a speaker because they have different personal ideas than others. And it was not, not only leadership by the dean, it was leadership by many of the medical students. This is one medical student who wrote, I am pro-choice, but pro-democracy, and what you're doing has to stop. We cannot be using what we call liberalism to silence other people. Dr. Collier spoke. She gave a fantastic talk that was unfortunately missed by many of the students who decided to walk out, and that was their prerogative. That was their right to walk out, and they did. But the news said, Michigan medical students walk out. It was only about a third of the class that walked out. 70% sat there, listened to her, and supported her. There is such a thing as fake news, unfortunately. The other thing that drives me is all the talk, because we have come up with this vocabulary. So I'm opening the bulletin of the American College of Surgeons. Here's the vocabulary you should be using about EDI. And it's like new words and you know all kinds of phrases. And I was thinking, really? You have stood against universal health care for the entire history of the American College of Surgeons. Is that what equity looks like, a bunch of talk? You know, we see doctors in white coats lying down on the grass, white doctors for black lives. But how many of those doctors help the single black mother who lives in the inner city who can't find care for her child or who doesn't know that her child's going to be safe the next day walking to school? We get upset when people don't use land acknowledgments. How many of you have spoken to your indigenous patients, to your Cree Inuit patients, and asked them, do you know what a land acknowledgement is? What does it mean to you? How many have actually done that? Because I've done that at least 20 times. And you know what? One family knew what it was. And when I describe it, they look at me like, not really sure how this helps us. One dad, a few weeks ago, told me, unseated? Unseated? You mean you have to remind us every time that we never ceded this territory? My friends, I'm not against any of those things. Those are great motives to do, but let's not do things because of us, because they make us feel like we're equitable and we're better and we're social and we're, you know, let's think of the people we're doing it for. Who are we doing it for and why? So I wrote this article, don't talk to me about equity. And I ended it like this, the ACS cannot quickly erase implicit bias or systemic racism, but it can take a giant step by endorsing a universal system of equitable healthcare for all. And if it does, that will resonate much louder than any statement, any commitment, or any vocabulary we create. We do live in an age of parasitic minds, and I worry that our equity, diversity, inclusion is gonna be an EDI of another type, an exclusion. If you don't agree with me, I don't wanna hear your voice. This is the opinion, this is the, the politically correct opinion, and if you dare differ, we don't need to hear from you, and you're not equal to us. And this is a phenomenon ripe in our society. Okay, so my, ma my first major failure comes in February 19, 1997. I thought I was very ready for a pediatric surgery fellowship. I had 14 peer-reviewed publications. Um, I had superb scores on my exams that people look at when they match. Um, I had interviewed in 20 of the 22 programs in the match that year. I thought I had strong letters, and I will share something with you in a minute. And I thought I was, you know, really enjoying an equity and inclusion until I started hearing things like, you know, your name doesn't look so good in a U.S. phone book. Uh, a program director in Canada asked me, somebody who was very, very prominent um, at the time, uh, do you want to be a chair of a department? And I said, I 
don't know. I never thought about it. Well, yeah, because people of your background never think of things like that. Um, and the second year I was in the match, one of my interviewers who decided you come and we're just going to spend time together and go to my son's hockey game in Detroit. He said, you know why you didn't match last year? Because of this. And he hands me a letter from a very prominent pediatric surgeon who happened to be at odds with my mentor. They had a, a, a fallen. And she had called me and asked me, do you want a letter? And I had I've never thought of asking her because I never worked with her, not a single day. But she had become the chair where I had done my research. And do you want a letter? And I said, my gosh, yes, of course. Do you want me to review your personal statement? Yes, thank you. And she wrote me the letter. And the letter was a letter to kick me out of the match. She wrote me a letter of four sentences that said, Dr. Emil spent two years doing research. He published 14 publications. Um, he made a number of uh, presentations. That was the recommendation letter. Many of the people we honor do not act honorably. It's not your public sphere. It's not how you look in front of people and the collaboration and, oh, you know, it's what you do when people are not looking that really counts. So I didn't match, and, and I had to ask myself, do I really want to be a pediatric surgeon? I pledged after this experience that I told you about that I will never write a letter for somebody who asked me unless I can write a strong letter. And I have refused letters for many residents and many students since. And I also um, thought, you know, I, I will re I will recover from this by looking around me and still counting all of the blessings that I had. And I'm not going to make a hasty decision, but you still have to follow your instinct. And a stumble is not a fall. And, and this was my, my, my pediatric surgery mentor at the time at Loma Linda. I was going through such a difficult time on a personal level. There was just so many things in my life that were falling apart. Um, one of my attendings and I, you know, people come to us, he was going through a, a divorce and people come to us and say, oh, you guys should try this and that. And he'd always say, yeah, but is it better, is it, is it better than crying? <laughs> we, he and I used to cry a lot together. And um, it was just a hard time. It was really a hard time. And, um, and he called me, my, my mentor, a couple of weeks after I didn't match and said, so when are you going to apply again? I said, Dr. Andrews, I'm not, I'm not going to try this again. I, I, he said, what are you talking about? Stop it. You stumbled. You didn't fall. Of course you are. That's what you want to be. That's what you're made for. And I'm so happy he called me that day. So um, Sam, our fellow, will remember this because I remember her commenting on my Facebook post. When people match, and the, the pediatric surgery match is brutal, people sacrifice so much, so many years of their life to become a pediatric surgeon. Still probably one of the most competitive spots to have in medicine in North America. But on the match, everybody's like congratulating and celebrating. And, and I'm thinking, but what about those who didn't match? And I've always written for the last several years to those who did not match. Um, and I, you see my Facebook post here, but today I'm thinking more of those who did not match because I also did not match. And when I've written these, the, the response has been amazing. These, these surgeons coming out left, right, and center, I also did not match. I also did not match. I, and, and you know, and it becomes like a non-matching party. Uh, and, and it really brings out, I think, the vulnerability in people, but also sometimes their best. But thank God I succeeded the following year, and it was really wonderful. I came to McGill, and I um, had two great gifts. First, my wife, who I met here at the Old Children's Hospital and pediatric surgery. And, um, I, you know, I, I cannot start to even describe to you what a blessing my wife is. Gabby and Ella, you have an amazing mother. And I hope you will always remember that. She's a woman of strength, of faith, unbridled faith, and just resilience that I have never, ever seen. My wife has really been a blessing in my life. Um, but the bonds I formed here when I left were amazing. Maria, I'm so happy you came in person today. What a treat it is. Um, this was the FMG day um, uh, when I was the Frank Gutman day. This is uh, Walt Schwalz, who was our visiting professor. Um, Dr. Williams and his secretary, and just amazing human bonds. But probably the most special bond was with my program director and mentor at the time, uh, Jean Martin. Some people just click, you know, and he clicked and we clicked. I left and I went back to University of California, Irvine, a relatively young department, but really a wonderful, wonderful place to work. Great group of people who were collaborative, who were 
um, democratic in the sense that everybody shared in the uh, blessings, but also the difficulties of the department. It was a wonderful place to be. Um, and uh, we used to have a full day to present when we finished our fellowship here at the Children's. And this is a, my last slide from my presentation at the time was a full grand rounds. And I said, this is what I'd like to do. And I was hired at the University of California Irvine as a clinical surgeon. I, I was just, you know, do some teaching, but we're not asking you to do global surgery. We're not asking you to do research, you know, basically. And, and I really didn't have to do a lot of these things, but don't let limited expectations stop you. Ha set your expectations for yourself rather than let somebody else set them for you. Um, I actually ended up doing all of those things in my years there, but the first thing I've done is to land in an environment where a surgeon that I had met years before, Dr. James Warden, who was Canadian, born in Ontario, but most of his career in Southern California, had been the surgeon there, the, the chief of surgery there, and had died just a few months after I had met him. And Dr. Warden was one of those gentle giants. He was this big guy who was always Santa Claus at the annual Christmas party. Um, but um, he was just full of love. And when he met me at a retirement party, he knew I was going to Kenya. He had been to Kenya many times. He had set up a fund named after his daughter who had died there. He took interest in me. And when I arrived at UCI, his aura, even though he had been gone for a couple of years, was everywhere. Everybody remembered Dr. Warden. Everybody has something to say about Dr. Warden. And the first thing I wanted to do is honor Dr. Warden because I knew that this is gonna be forgotten. So always ask when you get somewhere, who was here before me? It did not start with you. It never has, it never will. We always follow people and we always precede people. And I worked very hard in my very first year to establish the Warden Visiting Professorship and it was tremendously honorable and I was so honored to have Jean-Martin come and become the first visiting professor. Of course, it was January, the sun was shining, and he wanted to ski. But that's something else. Um, and you know, I was thinking about this, uh, Hayden, if you're, if you're on the call, happy Thanksgiving. Um, just a, a, a last week, I was in Texas, I came back, Hayden, our fellow there, is, um, is a staff surgeon now at Baylor Scott and & White, and, uh, and I didn't think about it at the time, honestly, but the morning I was driving with him to the hospital, to give this named lecture and be a visiting professor, I thought, amazing. I looked at him and he was so elated and proud to have me now in his practice. Um, and I thought, it's been 20 years since I felt exactly the same way when I had Jean-Martin come and be the first visiting professor. So the circle of life sometimes really is beautiful um, and it's something we should celebrate. Uh, my time at UCI was amazing. I loved the patients. There were a lot of sophisticated patients. Orange County, one of the richest places in the world, but there were also a lot of patients who nobody else wanted to take care of, and I was more than happy to take care of them. Um, and my nurse, Rosie, Rosie, if you're on the call, happy Thanksgiving, um, was um, an angel, and she surprised me when I was leaving uh, with a surprise party, but it was not with the surgeons and with the CEO. It was with the patients. She invited all the patients that I had grown really close to uh, for a surprise party. It was one of the best days of my life. Um, I was able to do all of the things. I was able to do the education programs, get students involved in research. Um, I started going overseas. This is Michael Moore, who invited us to the opening of um, his, uh, his movie on uh, healthcare. Uh, and we got really involved with the, with the entire universal healthcare movement on the political end and all that. And something really, you know, I, I chose some of these sentinel moments in my, in my life that really sort of changed things. Like just, there was like a before and after. And one of those moments came in March, 2022. I had only been at UCI for a few uh, months and I saw an email come through that we're having a medical student debate on universal healthcare. So one, one group will argue for, one group will argue against. And I was, um, I knew I was gonna be post-call. I operated all night that night. I was still working the next day. And so it was 4 p.m. Uh, I hadn't slept, I hadn't showered. I looked like horrible, but I said, I think I'm going to go, you know, see what they have to say. And I went to this debate and <laughs> I was just shocked. I was shocked. The group of students were through small uh, arguing for universal health care were getting mobbed. What are you talking about? Communism? Where is this in the Constitution? Are you kidding? And I was standing in the back because I looked horrible and I didn't really want to show myself, but I couldn't help it. I stood up and I said, can I say something? You guys should be ashamed of yourselves. We live in a country where everybody has a right to a gun but people don't have a right to a doctor. How could that be acceptable to you? And if you're talking like that, what are you gonna expect of? And it was like a pin had dropped, silence. I didn't know what would come out of that. So 
a little bit later, I went back to teach embryology, which has absolutely nothing to do with healthcare policy, but it was Martin Luther King Day. And at the end, I just put this, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, and the lesson is, it's okay, seize an opportunity wherever you may find it, even if it's not exactly what you want to talk about. I just left the students with this, and I just, I didn't, I didn't say you should do this or do that. I just said, get involved, educate yourself. And I say this to Canadian students here all the time. Students are not involved enough. We don't teach them enough about healthcare. And so a couple of months later, a year later, I was invited to give a talk at this uh, residence forum, this big research forum. And one of my residents was putting it on. He said, I need you to come and, and, and be the keynote speaker. And I said, I have nothing to talk about. I've been in practice for two years. I don't have a research body. I haven't invented anything. You know, what am I going to talk about? Whatever you want. But I just want you to come and be the keynote speaker. And I said, well, the only thing I can really talk about is universal healthcare. Sure. But I don't think anybody's going to show up, but at least we have, you know, a really interesting topic on the on the thing. So I spent quite some time uh, researching it to make it like really an academic talk, not just my opinions. And uh, I went to the meeting in Monterey, my wife will remember very well. And there was a big wake from the American Medical Association, like a really top C uh, administrator there. And I went to my room thinking, um, so there was this, you know, different sessions, and I went to my room thinking, well, I know the students don't really like this topic. I, I don't think they're gonna show up. And it was a standing room only crowd. Everybody wanted to hear about it. The guy from the AMA wasn't really getting much of a response. I, and I just gave this talk, Universal Health Insurance in America. It's a young doctor stupid and told them that they cannot look to their mentors for this. Their mentors have failed. You have to be the ones to carry this on. Um, so following this, I was asked to come give a selective at UCI. A selective is a really interesting for the medical students here. A group of medical students decides we want a short course or something, and then they plan it in the evening, and it's all planned by medical students. It was really a great, a great thing, and we said we, we want you to do the selective. We'll have a few students there. And I went, and again, I went thinking I'm going to be staying, sitting, talking to 10, 12 people, and I had an auditorium like this full. And not just with students, insurance company CEOs. <laughs> The dean. I mean, it was really unbelievable. Um, and we started the conversation. And what happened in the following few years was truly amazing because the students led a movement. The UCI students led a movement among students in California to bring universal health care on. And they would go uh, to Sacramento. And it was really one, again, the defi one of the defining moments in my life when I was invited to come back in June of 2010 after I had moved here to give the commencement address at UCI. So you can never predict the size of the tree that will grow from the seed that you plant. So everything was going fine. April 2007, we, were putting, we had put down an offer on a house. Uh, my practice was growing well. We really a great department of surgery. And a call comes from Jean Martin. I had an email come across my desk saying there's a position in Montreal for people who want to apply from CAPS. And I totally jokingly responded, should I apply? Because was, I was not thinking even of that possibility. My secretary was away, so a call came from the answering service saying, Dr. Leberge wants to speak to you. And he said, of course, yeah, apply. I was like, I didn't mean it that way. I was just joking. And we were traveling to New Zealand that night, and I told my wife, you won't believe what happened tonight. You know, Jean-Martin called and said I could apply. She's like, oh, you would never go back. And I said, yeah, you're right. I'd never go back. Um, so, um, so we were in a good steady state. We had just bought a house after years of trying because, you know, the housing market was going like this. And finally, the university stepped in to give us loans to buy. We could walk for a few minutes and we would have this view on the beach. I would get into my little cabrio probably four days out of five and put the, the roof down and drive to work and everything was good. Um, um, but I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, the MCH position was offered. It took a year and a half because Jean Martin had said, you know, um, I'm going to step down. I'm having grandkids. I want time to myself. I've been working too hard. We won't have enough prems, so you're going to be the most senior and the most academic, and you take the position. And I thought, this is a great excuse. And I said, no, 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 Jonathan, I, I would never do that. I would never take a position through the back door. I would never earn you know, my way into a position like that. So a few weeks passed, and he said, well, OK, I think I might step down. But then there's going to be a search committee, and I have nothing to do with it, and other people may be interested. And I said, OK, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, you know, I could look at it that way. And that's exactly what happened. And to be perfectly honest, I did not think I was going to get this position because I knew there were other Canadian surgeons. I was not Canadian. I had no work permit. Like I had no 
status in Canada, and I did not think I was going to get this position. There was also a major housing market crash underway. Within months of buying our house, it had already gone underwater. Um, and so things were very, very difficult. But at the end, I was offered the position after I thought, it's really a done deal, and I'm not going to get it. And it took a while, and I came here. And on November 3rd, I walked into a children's hospital. And I, you may remember that ramp that took you. I always like to use that ramp because I'll get a cookie or a coffee before I get to work. And, um, and I remember thinking, my gosh, it was 20 years ago that I came to this university as a medical student in the most unlikely of circumstances. And here I am coming back as chief of pediatric surgery. And this is something that would have never happened in my home country, just wouldn't have, for no other reason other than my name. We have so many relatives, my wife and I. And if you think, you know, with all due respect, people have made an industry out of, um, you know, portraying our societies as racist and unequal. Yes, we have so many sins in our background. We have residential schools, we have slavery. But let me tell you something. The North American experience, the Canadian and American experience is the best that humanity has ever seen with respect to equity, ever. And if you don't believe me, you just needed to live one day in a place where people look you straight in the face and tell you, we know you're the most qualified, but you're not going to get this position because your name is such. Try that out and then come and talk to me about equity and racism and all the other things that we love to pontificate about here. Um, so this was my plan. I had submitted this. It was approved by the research committee. Um, and I'm not going to read you all this, but basically I had sp very specific goals, a clear vision. But also when I came, I didn't want to come in and say, okay, let's do this and that. I just promised myself I'm going to spend six months watching. Let me just watch what's happening and talk to people. And I started with the small things. For example, one of the things is that we needed to pull the surgeons out of the ER. They had been working as medical students in the ER, suturing lacerations and doing things like that for 30 years. And I didn't think that was the right thing. Um, so we started with the things that were really like the least controversial that we already agreed on. And I, and I observed. And, and you know, but the lesson is don't dive into the water until you learn how to swim. Take your time and learn what's going on. But the very first thing I did, which was really important to me, is to pass the baton um, from Jean Martin to me and to honor him before we even start talking of what the future is to look at the past and really honor him for what he's done. And we did this within a couple of weeks of arriving here. And this is the first retreat we had. And really, I, I, I set my agenda that it will be built on openness, communication, fairness, and trust. And I wanted to pursue the servant leader model, which is simple. People may not believe what you preach, but they will usually believe what you practice. Not always. Because one thing I've learned is that there will always be people who will believe neither, who will always be oppositional. You will extend your hand once and twice and three times and four times, and it will be slapped. And you have a choice when you're a leader. I review a lot of departments who are going through difficulties, and I visit departments who are going through difficulties. And there's always a theme. The leader comes. Somebody in the group isn't interested in them being a leader. And the leader and that person makes it the issue, rather than trying to dilute that within the group. And that is so destructive, both to leadership and to the structure of teams. So um, I have been proud of my patients and proud of, uh, thanks James for being here today. We have several um, patients, parents with us today. Um, and proud of my team. And those two go hand in hand. They've always said, if we are doing a good job for patients, our team will be fulfilled, our fellows will be fulfilled. And if our team is fulfilled, we will do a good job for patients. Um, I have been uh, extremely proud of my group. I have um, seen it very clearly that when there is a conflict between the good of the group, uh, the best interest of the group, and the best interest even of our own department, that my job is to stand for the group um, and to advocate for what is best for us as a division of pediatric surgery. So celebrate your team, even when you feel sometimes that your team is not celebrating you even when you feel like you're being taken for granted, even when you feel that people are taking things that you've spent your life um, uh, building and excluding you from it. It's hard. It's hard to continue to celebrate your team when you're being treated like that. It is hard, but please do, because it's really the only way forward. Honor your predecessors. I am so proud that we've honored Dr. Beardmore, Dr. Gutman, 
the highest endowed visiting professorship in this hospital is named after Dr. Gutman. Dr. Laberge with the Jean-Martin Laberge Fellowship, and now Dr. Nguyen with the endowed award. And your mentors, um, you know, in addition to the Jean-Martin Laberge Fellowship, as you know, Jean-Martin was honored with the Mentor of the Year Award from the Royal College. He got the uh, MCH uh, Life Achievement Award. I mean, and yes, it takes time to nominate people and, and gather nominations and build them, but it's a good investment. Maria, Elen, our nurse, I think if you look at a per capita basis, we're probably the highest group to get uh, uh, MCH Foundation paid excellence in this hospital. If you look at us as a per capita basis, um, promote for his educational excellence and the work he's done, Dan, for the time he's committed, honored by the Royal College and by the American College Surgeons. All that takes time. It takes time. But if you as a leader do not embark on that, it won't happen. Uh, and even your leaders, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Um, Daniel gave me the opportunity to lead Dr. Farmer's nomination for the recent um, uh, MCH award. And, and Jean-Pierre, I know you're on the call, and thank you for everything you've done. It was really an honor to lead that nomination and see you receive it. So uh, going a bit faster, we only have about 15 minutes. Um, in 2013, um, a big idea came through. I got an email asking, can you write a book? Would anybody be interested in writing a book? And I asked myself, can I write a book? What will it add? And it seemed like a massive idea. But if an idea seems too big, think even bigger. And you know, there are a lot of good books. I thought, well, what, what, what do I have to contribute? And I started thinking, you know, there's a big gap between the practice of pediatric surgery and the science of pediatric surgery. When you read a book, you sometimes don't know how to take that and actually apply it to the patient in front of you. So I wanted to do something that I call the art of good judgment and why decision making that is very difficult to capture in any textbook or educational resource. Disease-based chapter, interactive uh, model, um, modeled after surgery radiology uh, conference, and then still cover the whole subject through additional cases and so on. And in August 2014, the, uh, so the publisher had it, you know, when you, when you put a book proposal, it's peer reviewed, just like a paper. It was peer reviewed, got super high scores, and we signed a contract. Um, and this is, would be an authored, as Dr. Hamdi said, not an edited book. Uh, and we, my co-author and I divided the chapters evenly. Um, our three superb pathologists at the time who were here um, were, to be, were to contribute to pathology, and the delivery date was August 1, 2016. But little did I know when I did that that I was about to enter one of the most difficult periods of my life. We were preparing to move to a new hospital. I was still running my, all my responsibilities. I was still making slow and steady progress, but the problem was that no chapters had been completed by my co-author. We had a miraculous arrival of our second child, Ileana. We called her Ileana because Gabby prayed for her for three months, every sing for three years, every single night. Lord, give me a baby brother, baby sister. We had all kinds of tragedies trying to have children. We had given up on it. And just before my wife was about to enter another cycle of treatment, the night before she found out she was pregnant. So Ella, that's why your name is Ileana. God has answered. Um, August 2016, my father diagnosed with a leukemia-like syndrome and my world was really falling apart again. Um, he continued to deteriorate in Benin. I was with my fellow Yasmin. Yasmin, I know you're on the, on the call from Paris today. Um, and I had to leave Yasmin behind early and I lost the only patient I've ever lost in all my African missions at that time. And Yasmin miraculously tried to save that patient by herself uh, on the ship. And it was a very difficult time. I arrived in Los Angeles very rainy day and I found 17 missed messages from her on my phone and I knew something bad had happened in Africa. Um, I was doing monthly trips to California to take care of my dad. I suspended my call responsibilities. I was really just trying to tread water. Uh, but also my co-author in the middle of all this decided to drop out and I had already put thousands of hours of work into the book. Um, and I was in the middle of all this being actively recruited for two California surgeon in chief positions. Uh, one was where I trained and the other was at UCLA, which was always my dream job. I thought if I could be a surgeon at UCLA, that would be, you know, slam dunk. But I was just exhausted. I, I couldn't see myself doing it. And I think it's important um, that no matter what the opportunity looks like and no matter what people are telling you, only you know your passion. Um, and that was a great lesson because I knew then that my passion was not to be a surgeon in chief. And that helped me many years later. You know, when the surgeon chief position opened here, I can't tell you how many people called, knocked at my door, sent emails. You're going to be applying, right? And I'll be like, no. Oh, yeah, so of course you are. And no, I'm not going to. But nobody tried to push me more to apply 
than our current Surgeon in Chief, Dr. Daniel, back there. And I think that speaks tons to who he is. And I'm just sharing the secret for the first time. Uh, but I still did not apply. I did not think it was what I wanted to do. Um, this is one of my last moments with my dad. It was an amazing afternoon in Los Angeles after a long, long rainy month. This is Gladstones. It's a restaurant. Maybe some of you have been there in Malibu. Amazing seafood place right on the beach. And I took my dad and we went at two because we figured it's not going to be rush hour. Two, wait, two hour wait, waiting time to get in. And I went to the waiter and I said, my dad just left the hospital and you know, I'm not sure we're going to be able to come back again. Come with me. And he gave us the best table <laughs> in the restaurant. And it was really a moment to cherish. But I was operating in a fog. Um, my dad was admitted to City of Hope uh, in 2017 on August 27. The next morning, I was helping Dr. Shaw with a procedure that I did many times, nothing tremendously challenging. Patient went on to have a mediastinal hemorrhage. We had to do an emergency sternotomy. I was massaging her heart with my hands. Uh, other people came in to help. Um, and I, I was torn because I wanted to know how my dad was doing. And here I was with a patient dying on my hands. Um, thankfully, she survived without any deficit and left the hospital intact. Uh, but my father was readmitted three days later now in severe respiratory failure, and the next day we left for Los Angeles. Um, he died on September 7th. This is Gabby's picture with him when we arrived. Uh, we had the funeral four days later. We returned to, my, returned to Montreal two days later. I was supposed to give grand rounds on September 14th, and everybody said, of course, it's going to be canceled. I said, no, I'm going to give it, because that's what, what my dad would have done. And I gave grand rounds on September 14th. I left for the American Academy of Pediatrics meeting on September 15th, Friday. I came back on the 17th and I started to call on the 18th. And I thought all this was good because the best thing to do is just to keep moving on, you know? Little did I know that I was making very, very bad decisions. I was making very bad choices. My, uh, my best friend's wife, Margaret, I know you're on the call, 4.30 in California. Thank you. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Um, she, she always dropped her daughter off in the morning telling her, make good decisions, make good choices. I didn't make good decisions or good choices during that period. On October 26th, I had my second major complication in a short period of time, divided the thyroid cartilage, which could keep a patient with a tracheostomy for good, while taking fellow, uh, fellow through his first operation on thyroglossal duct. And a couple of days later, I, I was living with chills and fevers up to 39, and I was just kept on going, working. Um, and then I was diagnosed with pneumonia and, and finally just had to be put out of work for a while. Thankfully, that child also survived and did well without any, uh, any uh, deficit whatsoever. So two real miracles, but two, two episodes due to very poor decisions. And people don't tell you when you're in a fog that you're in a fog. Unfortunately, that's one of our deficits. And now with new um, recruits and, and, and new spirits like Dr. Trudeau and, and Dr. Usanji and Dr. St. Louis, I know that they will change this culture where we have to tell each other, stop, you're in a fog. You can't keep on going, but nobody tells you. And, and you just have to stop and wait for the fog to clear because continuing to walk through it is, is sometimes very destructive. But I've tried to use that pain to share. We don't talk about this in medicine much. Um, Briseur de silence, uh, for my American friends on the call, it's breaker of silence. The, the writer couldn't really find a whole lot of people who want to talk about this, so he, he called it breaker of silence. And I've used some of the really painful, you know, I've written a lot of papers, but this paper about a little girl who's absolutely lovely, came in with something that looked trivial and ended up dying of it. I have never gotten as many emails uh, about anything I've written. People from literally all over the world were writing and saying, you've just shared our story. We've had stories like that that we've never shared. And uh, we recently did something with the American Pediatric Surgical Association, where again, they recruited me to speak about this. And you know, there's kind of silence and awkwardness at the beginning. And then the minute I shared this, Everybody started coming through and saying, oh, I, I went through this. I, this happened to me. We need to be talking about this more. So back to the book, what was happening? Well, the editor was very supportive. A decision, um, I, I had to make a decision either to drop it or to write my co-author's chapters. We, I needed another 18 months, which meant another hundreds and hundreds of hours away from my kids to do the book. Uh, but what was really painful was the relationship with my co-author because my co-author was somebody who was really dear to me. And it was hurtful. It was hurtful to see him dropping this, but not just dropping it, but during the time still taking on projects and being open to help with this and help with that. And it was just very hurtful. And I, 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 I'm a very open person. I, I, don't, I don't have agendas. I always talk to people face to face. I found it very hard to speak about that because I felt that was, it would probably lead to a, a major breakthrough and, and breakdown. And I, and, I, and I got through it by two things. 
um, in all honesty. Um, one is we've all failed other people. You know, we've all, we've all come short. We've all had times when we did not live up to our expectations. And, and, and it's important to reflect on that when you think somebody else is behaving like that. The second is nobody is monolithic. I mean, with the, the case of my co-author and I, I mean, there are so many times when he's come through to help and be there and, and support. And I thought, no matter how large this is, it doesn't negate all of that. And thankfully, our relationship has not only sustained, but has grown even stronger in the last few years. Um, and amazing what a difference a year makes. 2018 comes, Etienne and I in Cameroon, fantastic mission. I get a big alumni award. I get the Saputo chair. James, you're in that picture. Um, you know, wonderful things. I am able to establish CANCOR, the Canadian Consortium for Research in Pediatric Surgery, a dream I've had for many years. Finally, the organization, National Research Organization, comes through. Um, my book, December of 2018, I'm on call, December 20, midnight. I write my last piece. I had written the esophageal atresia chapter, the longest chapter in the book, and my computer crashed and was completely lost. Two weeks of work. I had to rewrite the entire chapter again, finished it in December, wrote this um, um, first page in the book, the dedication. It was midnight. I got down on my knees in my office. There was nobody around. I thank God and I broke out crying. And for many who make fun, because I know I talk about the book a lot and I tell them it's my baby, bury, you know, bury it with me and so on. And, 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 you know, and I know my nurses are tired of hearing about it, but this is because it's not, it's not about the book. It's about the miracle that it took to write it in the most difficult of circumstances. Um, and the first person who held it was Gabby. And I could not have chosen a better person to touch it for the first time. But what I didn't expect at the time is that this book would change my life. It would change my life because in, in cooperation, collaboration with Mark Levitt, my friend in DC, we created this program to share the book completely free of charge to people who can't buy it. And we've shared it with 80 countries, 270 institutions, thousands of trainees. And now we've gotten to meet pediatric surgeons and trainees we would never ever have met. And I've traveled from Ecuador to Romania to Indonesia and the community is there. And it's really been an incredible blessing to create this community of surgeons around the world. So 2019, the steady state is back. Uh, finally sold my parents' house in California, which I had to you know, do pretty much on my own. My practice was thriving. Everything was going well. Saputo chair was, was going well. Had a great successful mission trip to Guinea with our research fellow. And came back from Africa and it was Lent. I, I was fat, I was not, you know, I don't drink alcohol during Lent and I started having some pain in my, in my, in my belly and I asked my, my colleagues, oh yeah, you're probably just working hard and a little bit stressed. So I thought, okay, let me talk to my GI colleagues. Yeah, take some Pepsid and take some antacids. And <laughs> I went on for a week like this, again, working with pain. And then one night I couldn't breathe. The pain was 10 out of 10. I could not breathe. It was midnight. My kids were asleep and I told my wife, I'm just gonna go check some labs in the hospital. She's like, I gotta come with you. No, 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 you stay, I'll go. I went to a children's hospital because <laughs> and I met Dr. Sus Capusi, who was on call that night, and I said, Ava, I'm really not feeling well. Do you mind just checking my amylase lipase and a few tests? And she said, yes, I will, but you have to stay here. You don't look good. I said, no, no, no I'm going to go wait in my office. I'm first going to be fine. So, and I went and got an abdominal series, by the way. I wanted to make sure I don't have a bowel perforation. So the tech was very nice. I said, sure. And I looked at it. Okay, no free air. Good. Uh, so, um, so I went to my office, and the nurse was so concerned about me. He came after me and said, I just want to make sure you're okay. You don't look well. So labs were very abnormal, and I took my labs. I went to the, to the VIC right around the corner, and I said, I'm a pediatric surgeon here, and I have pancreatitis. And she's like, sir, 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 I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting an ambulance. Just wait. I'm like, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> but the triage nurse heard me and came out and said, you were a pediatric surgeon here? I said, yeah, and I'm really, really in pain. I need some morphine. Come with me. And things happened very quickly, CT scan. And I remember very well the resident walking towards me after the CT and his head hanging low. And I'm thinking, Lord, I've always promised myself never to ask why me. We should always ask why not me. I mean, we're in the healthcare business. You know, we see people all the time who are stricken with things that they never expected. Why couldn't it be us? So he's like, Dr. Emil, you have uh, IPMN. And I said, IPMN, what is that? <laughs> never heard of that because we don't see it in kids. And I finished general surgery a long time ago. Well. 
he said something about pancreatic and neoplasm. And I knew that those two don't usually go well together. You know, pancreas, neoplasm, that's not a good combination. So there's never a good time to take life for granted. Um, it seemed like everything I'd been working with is kind of a moot point. And the next day, a surgeon came with a big team. And I, by the way, I had to call my own consults, arrange for my own MRI. I was using that hospital phone like crazy because nobody was coming to see me. And the nurse had me on 200 cc's of saline and I was needing to pee every half an hour. And I said, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, that's our protocol. I said, well, it might be a protocol, but I'm removing my IV for a little while because I need to get some sleep. Anyway, but the surgeon comes in on Saturday morning. You're going to need a Whipple within a short period of time. because, And I'm like, what? A Whipple? I don't know if you know what a Whipple, but it's the most aggressive treatment and surgery. Um, and, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I was finally revealing it to my, to my team. And one of my, my colleagues, Dr. Shaw might remember because he commented on that. He said, oh, I just gave the board exams and you do need a Whipple. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. Uh, and, um, and I thought, man, I'm really not, you know, am I really doing what's, what's right for me? Um, but I, I was feeling okay. And, you know, people said, you can't go to Africa anymore because what if you get sick and you can't do this? And I said, that, and I sent an email to my group uh, that they might remember. And I said, you know, God is always in control. If it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. I'm going to live my life the way I've lived it. I'm going to go to Africa. I'm going to do all my work. And uh, I've since had seven MRIs, two PET scans, two endoscopic ultrasounds, two biopsies. And I'm still here four and a half years later. And all I wanted is just to finish my term. Mission accomplished. No Whipple, by the way. I haven't had it yet. Uh, I'm going to finish with this. Um, sweet serendipity, because this is another life-altering moment for me. Um, I had just come back uh, from... Uh, Rwanda and um, Rajah Martin and I used to um, do do some work there, and uh, it was the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. So I had written this piece for the Globe and Mail um, because they had seen some of my blogs and wanted me to write about it. And and a few months later, I got a call saying Mercy Ships wants to talk to you, and I had no idea what Mercy Ships was. I thought it was a U.S. Navy Mercy ship, and I thought, why would they want to talk to me? And they told me what it was and asked me to be on the board and, and sent me some information. And I was just really struck by what I saw. I thought, can there really be something like this? Um, and I joined Mercy Ships. And in 2016, I started going. I've been going every year, six different uh, African countries now, taking my kids some time. What an amazing organization. People who put everything aside to provide really for the least among us. And I'm going to read you these three. Uh, what? has been the lesson for myself from Mercy Ships. And I wrote this after my first mission as I was leaving. I tried to share the story of the Africa Mercy these last two weeks through these dispatches, but I have only scratched the surface. You see, the real story of the Africa Mercy is not just about free surgical care among the poorest of the poor of Africa. It is not just about planting hope in the midst of despair. It's not just about capacity building in resource poor countries. It's not even just about making a difference in the lives of tens of thousands, one life at a time, one country at a time. The real story of the Africa Mercy is about mercy, a merciful community, diverse and always changing, that has chosen to show its love through its actions. And in a world where evil is not only done, but also celebrated, advertised, and paraded, the people of the Africa Mercy remind us of what we, as humans, can accomplish if we're driven by mercy. As I get ready to start my long way back home, I will cherish the vision of mercy I've experienced these last two weeks. And if I can apply that lesson in my own life, among my family, my patients, my colleagues, then I will succeed in keeping part of the African Mercy experience within me until I join this loving community again at a new port in a new country. And it has changed my perspective so much. You know, I used to make a big deal out of a committee assignment or, or being on this organization. And these things have come to mean so little for me. They really have. Because you know what? A couple of years after you step down, Nobody will remember who occupied this position. Nobody remembers who was the president of the American Pediatric Surgical Association five years ago. None of us do, and we're big members of it. But the work that is done there changes lives for good. And there were lessons for my trainees. When um, Etienne and I were there together, we were, all, we were both blogging on the Royal College website, and he was sending his blogs, and I was sending my blogs, and it was just such an amazing experience for me to share with him. And I wrote this. Many trainees come to the Africa Mercy with their attending staff. The experience cannot be duplicated in our training environment. They will see late presentations of disease. They will understand the effect of poverty, abject poverty on health and life. They will learn to manage fragile patients. They will have to make difficult decisions. They will have to function well outside their comfort zone. But most importantly, they will see altruism not just lectured and spoken about, 
but lived every moment of every day. They will experience the healing power of common purpose and common vision, not just to patients, but also to us who take care of them. And for my kids, and it's been such a blessing to take my kids with me a couple of times. And the first day Gabby arrived in Guinea and we went to the market, it was a day I will never forget because I looked at her. And as I say here, I look at the face of my seven-year-old daughter and try to elicit a response. Gabby is stone-faced in pure culture shock. She did not know such a world existed, but I know her well. She will be asking many questions in the days to come. Questions about poverty, illness, pollution, inequality, and much more. We will speak and come up with few answers, but the conversation would have started my first goal. Back on the ship, Gabby is again closer to her comfort zone, but she also senses something different about this community as everyone celebrates our arrival and reaches out to share whatever they can. She is already asking why all these volunteers are here, why they're serving without getting paid. She's starting to understand the meaning of service, selfless, genuine service, my second goal. I show Gabby the map to explain that we have arrived on the other side of the world, but it's more than geography. It is the other side so easy for us to ignore, so easy for us to live as if it did not exist. I am hoping that this trip will impress on my children that such a world indeed exists. And that there are people from many nations, driven by a very special calling, who could have enjoyed all the comforts of our world, but have instead decided to come to this one and help. And for the trainees here, there are three lessons that I want to share with you real quick. First, we all want to learn. These two pictures are taken just a few months apart. One is in the Cleveland Clinic, the very, very top of medical care and education as we know it. One is in Kenyatta Hospital, Nairobi, probably way at the bottom of the ladder. And you know what? The spirit is exactly the same. It doesn't matter where you are. People are driven to learn. People want the very best. They're looking for inspiration. In your career, when you start young and you're thinking, my gosh, will we ever get somewhere with this? Be patient. Uh, this is the hospital, the Coptic hospital I used to go to quite often, three or four times before I started working with Mercy Shifts, before we moved here. And then I started working with other organizations. And it was like three huts and a garage for an operating room. My wife has been with me a couple of times. And we arrived back in last March. It was midnight when we got there. The next morning, I woke up to go to the hospital and I saw this. I thought, wow. Wow, what an amazing, amazing, amazing blessing it's been. And finally, don't get discouraged. Regardless of where you are, it's not about the system. It's not about the policy. It's not about the politics. It's always about one patient at a time and one learner at a time. It will always stay like that. This was about lessons. And uh, I wrote this for Gabby as she graduated from elementary school. She probably will understand it a bit more later. But as I was preparing for Etienne's graduation, I thought, so funny. It's just as applicable to him. I think I will read him the same thing. And today, that is my actual gift to all of you. As you get ready to take on the world, remember this. It is not what we do in life that matters, but it's how we do it. It's not the number of friends that matter, but the genuineness of each friend. It's not the times we stand with large crowds that matter, but the times we stand alone. It is not the uttering of the conventional wisdom that matters, but the uttering of what the world finds inconvenient to hear. It is not the noise of the majority that matters, but the silent yearning of the minority. It is not the accolades of others that matter, but our own convictions that we have done the best that we are capable of doing. It is not what we preach that matters, but what we practice. It is not all the doubts that matter, but the faith that is born out of those doubts. It's not the moments of despair that matters, but the hope that sees us through these moments. So many of you have been asking me, what's on the horizon? It's actually not a very good question. You know why? Because the horizon is so far away. By definition, you will never reach it. And as you get closer to it, it gets even further away. All I can tell you is I feel liberated because for the first time in my life, perhaps, I don't have big goals. I don't have big, huge programs I want to establish. I don't have a position that I need to be in. I really don't have any of that. My passions will never change. My passion for patient care, my passion for research that just doesn't just publish paper, but changes practice for the better. My passion for educating people around the globe, all those are the same, but that has become part and parcel of my life. I don't really have any big goals right now. I'd like to see ERAS happen, but it's happening in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. And I really actually feel very liberated. 
to finally be in this spot. What I do need to do is I need to relearn life in the next phase of my life. Because the people who are closest to me are the people who've paid the most dearly for everything I have done. And sometimes I compare my kids to, you know, patients with esophageal atresia that we have. They've never had a normal esophagus. They live life fine, even though they don't swallow right. But they, that's all they've been used to, and they do fine. My kids are like that. They've never known a different life. But my wife has. And it's been very, very difficult for her. And I have a huge amount of relearning to go through to readjust my life to a better balance that I have never been able to attain. Thank you. Thank you, everybody online, for being here. Thank you, my friends, family, my colleagues. Um, Every one of you has been a blessing in my life. It really has been a tremendous journey. God bless you all. God bless this institution where we all work. And God bless the city, province, and country we call home. Thank you so much.